Ha for the children and adults that were ruthlessly murdered in Peshawar, for all of them, all of their family members, and for the Sabr and Jamil of all of the mothers and the fathers of the victims. Surat al Fatiha, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لكي لا تعسوا على ما فاتكم ولا تفرهوا بما آتاكم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسول الكريم والحمد لله رب العالمين Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi عليه السلام My respected brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله وجولنا وأجولكم بمصابنا أبي عبد الله الحسين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه Welcome to our third part in our health and medical ethics series and this evening insha'Allah we commence the series proper in that we are blessed with the opportunity to bring together the panel to allow us to speak on an Islamic perspective and on a medical perspective on our first topic which is under the title of med mental health and tonight, tonight insha'Allah emotional health. This evening, insha'Allah, we will look at the topic of depression and our panel consists of two very experienced brothers in the community who probably are no strangers to us. We have Dr. Riaz, sorry, I don't know why I called you Riaz, Dr. Safraz Jairaj and Councillor Bilal Ali and both of them are uh, experts in their field in order to allow us to delve into the medical side and explore things that maybe you and I may not have heard of, things that we can take away and implement into our own lives and explore with our friends and families wherever necessary, inshallah. So my role this evening is just to be able to start on the Islamic perspective of the questions of uh, emotional health, of depression in particular, and then I would like to pass it on to uh, the rest of the panel to be able to explore this particular topic. As usual, at the end, we hope to be able to have time to invite questions and to engage in some dialogue. So please make notes on your phone, bring pads and pens, especially next week, from next week, to be able to write down the many points that you've heard, because a lot of this is going to be very practicable advice for us to be able to take away things that were going to be very necessary for us in our community. Depression is often a topic with much stigma to it. So from the perspective of our own terminology or my terminology, when I use the word depression, there are two types of depression. There will be the depression which is not permissible in Islam and there will be the depression which is the medical side. And so when I talk, I will need to be able to distinguish the two and you also will need to follow as to which type of depression I am speaking about. In terms of mental health, in terms of um, emotional health, Islam does not neglect this in any way, shape or form. The Quran and the Ahadith speak much about emotional health and the balance of an individual. For if a person is not balanced and not 
right or not balanced in the way in which they deal with their emotional health, then the reality is this impinges upon their spirituality and vice versa. And so for all parts of our life, we need to become very balanced human beings and learn to deal with matters of grief, learn to deal with trial and difficulty in our lives, and also when we see trial and difficulty in the lives of our friends and family. The Quran spoke about this in many places. For the sake of brevity, I have picked one verse which comes to us from Surah Al-Hadid, chapter number 57 of the Holy Quran. There are a series of verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from around verse 20 to 25 speaks about the matters of mental health, the matters of emotional health. And he says that is nothing that occurs in your life, nothing that occurs in the entire universe, except that it's already written in a book by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Kitabin Mubin. He's already expressed it, he's already written what will happen to us at an individual level, the challenges we will face in regards to health and wealth and family and everything else. Having then stated that all of this has already been written in a book, all the challenges that you and I will face, he gives to us a beautiful statement of remaining balanced in our lives. He says, And so do not become despondent at that which is taken away from you, and do not become overjoyed at that which is given to you. Do not become despondent and do not become overjoyed. Meaning, be in between these two positions. Be balanced as a human being. You and I are going to face trials. It will occur. This is part and parcel of the system of life. The reality is all of these trials are there to complete us and actually there to become the all-round perfect human being. And so we cannot become the perfect, all-round, balanced human being unless we undergo these challenges. And in fact, as the famous statement goes, the more God Almighty loves you, the more He will test you. And so you can expect to be tested in various ways of your life. The reality of this balance is the discussion on depression and despondency. There is a very famous book translated into English available in our bookshops, in our shelves here, which is by Ayatollah Dasta Ghaib Shirazi. May Allah uh, grant him a uh, high place in heaven, inshallah. He has written a book called Ghunahani Kabira, The Greater Sins. And in there, second and third greatest sins are despondency and loss of hope. In this sense, what Ayatollah Dasta Ghaib Shirazi wants to highlight is that when one loses hope in God, when one becomes despondent in God, this means that they have given up on God. And as such, they reduce God by not seeing that He is all-knowing, all-wise, and all-powerful. And so the statement of depression here is not similar to the medical concept of depression. Because many times when someone does undergo challenges in their life, they do become saddened and grieved. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one has lost hope in God. But rather they are going through challenge in their life, and so there is a downward spiral that causes the sadness and the grief, which will be expounded upon shortly, inshallah. And so here is the differentiation, the demarcation between the two points. There is a type of depression which is the medical side of depression that we need to understand the root and the causes of. The root and the causes may be similar to the type of depression that is a sin. But the type of depression that is a sin according to Shi'i theology is the specific type of depression, depression where someone loses hope in God and says, God is no longer there to assist me. He has left and vacated my life. I do not have him to rely upon. He does not see me and he cannot lift me from my circumstance. That type of depression, that type of hopelessness, that level of grief, that is the type of grief that is not permissible in Islam. 
not the type that we're going to explore in the medical notion or in the mental notion, inshallah, in a few minutes. The reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there for his servants, no matter how difficult it may become. The person who was afflicted the most in his life was Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. To the extent where he says in a famous hadith, Ma uthiya nabiyya mithla ma uthiit. There is no prophet who has had to undergo the difficulties which I have had to undergo. In the 23 years, none has had to undergo what I have had to undergo. And indeed, the challenges made Rasulullah very saddened. Ayat after ayat has been revealed upon this issue. For example, in chapter 18 in Surah Al Kaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئَ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ in lam yu'minu bihad al hadith asafa you will almost die of grief because of how much you want these people to become guided rasulullah was under great level of stress great depression not in the depression sense that he had lost hope in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depression in the sense that he was overwhelmed with sadness by the trials in his life by people doing what they were doing against him this was a different type of depression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there to support him. He says, La yahzunka an qawluhum. Do not become depressed, grieved by their words. And so when we become depressed, when we become saddened, when we become overwhelmed with difficulties, this is part and parcel of the life. But it is not to become depressed in a way whereby I lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or I allow myself to go through a downward spiral. From the Islamic perspective, I am required to turn towards God and dissolve myself in His hope and hope that He will lift me out of whatever it is that I am going through. The very best example of this is the example of Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam, that having lost 18 members of her family on one day, having lost 72 protectors, having had her tents burned and her garments snatched and everything else that occurred on the 11th of Muharram, she went to the body of her brother, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, threw herself towards it, placed her hands underneath it, raised the broken body of Hussein slightly towards the sky and said, Ilahi taqabbal min hadhan qurban min ali Muhammad. She did, not become over, she did not become overly grieved by what she had undergone. Indeed, she was a broken human being. Indeed, there was no one who had underwent more than what she went on the 10th and 11th of Muharram and beyond. But it was her faith in God that managed to raise her and stopped any genuine depression of loss of faith in God. And that was why a human being was able to undergo and still survive and flourish despite all of those circumstances. In light of this, someone who doesn't believe in God may still also not undergo depression with the trials in which they have. And someone who believes in God may also undergo depression. And so in light of that, we pass it over to our panel to be able to explore in terms of the medical side and inshallah, we'll have a more all-round comprehensive picture of our discussion. Please welcome both of our guests with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I don't have to introduce myself, hopefully, to too many of you, but uh, I'm Dr. Sarfraz Jaraj. Um, and professionally, I uh, work as a clinical psychologist, part-time in clinics, working uh, in the NHS as a, as a psychologist to treat people with mental health problems. Uh, and part-time, I, I lecture uh, at the University of Surrey um, to trainee psychologists who may go on to do the same. Um, the, the two main objectives we had for uh, today's session, and inshallah ongoing sessions, number one, to raise awareness of issues that may be prevalent in our communities, but because of our, of our lack of understanding or, or any other reasons, we can't talk about them. 
or that there's undue shame or stigma attached. So inshallah, having more knowledge about these issues will allow us to talk about them. And then the second objective is that if we recognize within ourselves or within another um, member of our community, another lover of the Ahlul Bayt among our midst, it becomes our duty to try and take whatever steps we can to help them, to help them through. Uh, and whether it's us or whether it's one of uh, our community, um, maybe all of this is part of a, a test. Um, and how we respond is, is what we'll be answerable for on the Day of Judgment. Um, I just wanted to start off with uh, a, a very brief overview before I hand over to uh, Brother Bilal of um, mental health. Uh, depression is one facet, it's one emotional state. But what is mental health? Um, if I get us to start by thinking about something that's a bit more familiar, and that's physical health. Um, how, how are you doing out there physically? One person said Alhamdulillah, so we've got some thumbs up. So um, there's some indication that physical health seems to be okay, um, but we're, we've all been there when physical health hasn't been okay. Um, maybe we've got uh, some kind of a medical condition, a physical condition. Sometimes you fall ill, you get better. So we're familiar. Now, if you are suffering with bad physical health, what do you do? You, you go to the doctor. Well, you, you might start off, if you, if you live where I do, by um, taking two paracetamol or having honey and hardar and garam dood. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of self-care remedies. You know, suija, get, get some rest. Um, but if, if that doesn't solve the physical problem, then, then we seek expert advice and we go to the doctor. Now, what about our emotional health? Do we even recognize when we're not feeling emotionally healthy? So when our mood changes or when it changes in a negative way where we're experiencing more irritability, anger, anxiety, depression, and, and maybe that's, is, is, I mean, are these things that are just in the West or, or, or are these things that occur in, in all cultures? Um, the, the word khaf, pareshani, fikr, munjaro, gabrat. Yeah. So it, across cultures, we have expressions for our emotional states, and all of these states, like our physical health, can sometimes be healthy, sometimes be unhealthy. If we can be more aware of what's healthy and unhealthy, we might be able to do something about it when it's not going the way we want it to. If we can recognize what the, some of the symptoms to look out for, we can try and do something about our, ourselves. We can help others do something about it. And if it reaches a point where we've tried and we haven't been as successful as we want, then just as we do with physical health, we need to seek some professional advice and support. Last point I just wanted to make about mental health uh, more generally um, is that you either, is it that you're either well or you're unwell? Is, is, is that how we think it works? That is how a lot of people might think it works. I just want to propose to you a, a slightly different way of thinking about it. Um, in the same way as our physical health works, it's not just you're well or you're sick. Sometimes you can kind of be okay, kind of in the middle. Um, sometimes you can be really sick. Um, and ultimately, we exist on a continuum. It's not one or the other. You can kind of be anywhere along that. How's your mood today? Feeling fantastic? Feeling terrible? or kind of somewhere along that continuum. So if we can acknowledge that our emotional health, just like our physical health, can exist anywhere on this continuum, can, is, and is dynamic. It isn't one place all the time. And along with that, just because 
our emotional health is poor at one stage, it doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. And we mustn't confuse it with one of the biggest misconceptions that's out there. And that's craziness, madness, being buggle. Just because my emotional ill health is poor at one point, we can't equate it with that. It's like saying, oh, you know what? This guy's got a cough. Keep away from him because he's probably going to have AIDS. Oh, you know, this guy's got a headache. It's, you know, it's over for him. He's going to be dead in two weeks. Um, these are spurious connections. And by, inshallah, by being more aware and having more knowledge on these issues, we can be less judgmental maybe on ourselves and more importantly, less judgmental towards others. Now, today we're having this discussion around depression. Depression, like I said, is just one facet of mental health, and there are many other facets, and depending on kind of, you know, how much uh, our community is interested in it, we may discuss uh, other facets. So please do share your, your feedback with us. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Brother Bilal. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. I'm uh, probably not as well known as, as the doctor or, or the sheikh, so maybe I should uh, say a few words about myself and what it is that I do. Um, for those of you who have maybe seen me around in the community, or possibly on a Saturday evening on uh, Safiya TV on Sky 847 or www.safiyatv.com, for the Dow Bridge, uh, that, that may be uh, one way that you've seen me around, but I'm um, actually in my day job. I'm a counsellor and, as the Sheikh mentioned, a, a psychotherapist. Uh, I've been asked to speak just a few words, a few remarks about what depression is. And um, I guess it's something that we, we all are familiar with the term, but we have uh, different perceptions or different ideas about what depression actually is. Um, essentially, everybody feels, you know, everybody at some point in their life feels sad from time to time. But when we're talking about depression, we're speaking about feeling persistently low for maybe weeks, maybe months, sometimes even years. And along with the actual feelings of uh, feeling low, there's triggers that come with, with uh, depression. Depression is related essentially to, to loss. Sometimes that loss may be the loss of a person in our lives as in, or a bereavement type loss. It can be a difficult divorce or even the loss of position, like the loss of, you know, at work they're downscaling. I don't know if my job's safe. I don't know how things are going to pan out for me. And people often feel depressed. But um, one of the things that we can be often uncertain about is if we're clinically depressed, there's, there's different types of depression. So, for example, you have depression, which is, let's say, organic. That's based on some physical problem, a chemical imbalance in your mind. That's often termed as bipolar or, or commonly referred to as mania. Now, that, that type of depression would need treatment from a psychiatrist essentially and you need to take medication. I guess what we're focusing on today is more depression related to uh, psychological mood and as I mentioned those are the type, that's the type of depression that's uh, triggered by, by loss and when we experience these type of loss or certain types of loss, loss of a relationship, position, status, uh, whatever they may be, we have a certain way of interpreting that loss, of evaluating that loss in our lives. And, it's, and based on that evaluation, that determines if we feel a healthy negative emotion, which is sadness, which is a natural response to a difficult situation. If somebody loses their best friend in a car accident, for example, it would be natural for them to feel down, for them to feel low for a period of time. When it becomes unhealthy and becomes, and uh, let's say, evolves into depression, is when the symptoms are persistent. Feelings of hopelessness, feelings of helplessness, sometimes symptoms may relate to a lack of energy. We feel that we have lost interest in those things that we used to do. We've lost uh, our appetite. Also, with depression, as I, um, it can be said that you know, we, can see no, we can see no way out. Why, why, why is depression an issue for Muslims in the Western world? Uh, why is, that, why is that relevant? You may ask the question because we have Quran, we have the teaching of the Alul Bayt. Um, what I do know from research is that post 9-11, I'm not saying it didn't exist before, but post 9-11, some studies have suggested that Muslims have started to feel even more cases of uh, depression being recorded. But because of 
Muslim culture, people tend to feel a stigma, something that's attached, um, something that's negative about experiencing depression. That you know, as, as a doctor mentioned, that people you know label are uh, scared of being coming labelled as crazy or even may question it, maybe a, a crisis of faith. Should I really be feeling like this if I if I have it in mind? What does this just say about me as a Muslim? So, I guess what I would hope to share with you today and, uh, is that depression can be something that is very normal, a very normal part of the human journey. That is something that you, if you think that you're experiencing depression, there's no harm in speaking to a professional. That might be your first protocol, could be your, for example, your GP. There's no harm in just, you're not gonna get sectioned or anything of that nature or, you know, um, given a liquid cosh as they call it, like a forced injection. It's, ju it's just a conversation with your, with your GP. He, may, he, may, he or she may assess you, ask you to fill out a questionnaire, a short form, and um, depending on what your score is, they may say, suggest at your will, uh, you know, you have to cooperate, obviously, if you'd like to go for counseling to see a psychologist, a, a therapist, or medication. As, as I mentioned, there's different types of um, depression. You have uh, postnatal depression, and that's, that can be treated with either talking therapy or medication. You have um, sometimes this time of year when the days get shorter, there's also um, seasonal affective disorder, which they call sad. The days are short and there's less sunlight. So some people actually, it just impacts their mood and they just really can't get on, get energized or they find themselves feeling down quite, quite a lot of the time. But the main thing I guess I'd like to share with you today is that to see it as normal, to not be ashamed. Don't let shame be a barrier. Oftentimes what can happen is when we feel ashamed about things, we isolate ourselves, we bottle our emotions up, and then eventually it spirals and becomes it becomes worse. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm more looking forward to the to the, the questions and answers. I think I've, I've said enough about depression. I don't want to de make you depressed, but <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully um, you can ask some questions, and inshallah, I'll be able to to help as well as uh, the doctor this year. Um. I just, if I could just add, add uh, a couple of points in terms of us being able to recognize what, what should we be looking out for in, in ourselves uh, and maybe people around us that actually gets us thinking, you know, may, maybe there's something I can do to help here. Um, so uh, if, you've, uh, if you've got a phone, uh, you might want to sort of record your, your, your answers to the questions I'm about to, to share with you. Um, if not, it, it doesn't matter, and, and this isn't a test. This is just something that gives you an indi indicator, something to look out for. So question one, in the last week, um, what proportion of days have you been feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Question two. Over the last week, what proportion of days have you just not been having any interest in anything? You know, just not enjoying the things that you perhaps used to enjoy. Question three, what proportion of days in the last week have you been eating much less or much more than usual? Question four, over the last week, what proportion of days have you been feeling a lot less energy than you normally would? Question five, over the last week, what proportion of days have you been sleeping a lot more or a lot less than usual? Question six, over the last week, what proportion of days has your concentration not been as good as usual? Question seven, over the last week, how many days have you been feeling more negatively about yourself or about others? You know, when you look out the window, when you look out across uh, space, everything just feels, looks more negative. It's very difficult to try and connect with anything positive. Um, question nine, uh, question eight rather, um, over the last week, what proportion of the week have your normal desires been diminished? 
And the last one is probably the most serious one for us to consider um, because it, it can literally be a matter of life or death. Over the last week, what proportion of days have you had thoughts about harming yourself or killing yourself? So the list I've just gone through is a, a list of some of the symptoms that can exist on depression from the really mild scale. If It might just be if your total sort of score was just a small proportion of some of the symptoms to the more severe end of really chronic depression, um, which is um, experiencing a lot of these symptoms for a large proportion of the week. So although it may not apply so much to yourself, when you look around, when you, when you think about your friends and your loved ones, you know, have, have their eating habits changed? Have they become more withdrawn? Are they not seeming to enjoy themselves? Do they seem to be a lot more negative? And if it is, you know, something that's just uh, for, for a week or two, you can link it to a, a really negative event in their life. Of course, that's natural. It's when we get stuck in that process. It's when our attempts to cope with that difficulty then become part of the problem. So, for example, someone who maybe attends here on a regular basis, but we've noticed, I haven't seen this brother or this sister for a while may be a symptom of them becoming more, more withdrawn because it's difficult for them to cope. And what you can do and what may now become your responsibility with the awareness is to call that brother or sister, to help build their hope, to help make them think that actually, you know what, someone's thinking about me, someone cares. And inshallah, we can support them, bring them back on that journey to start breaking out of those unhelpful behaviors maybe unhelpful patterns of thinking and re-engage with the community, really start to become themselves and help achieve their goals, help us achieve our goals uh, in serving our creator. Sorry if I've uh, gone on a little bit, uh, but I hope that's given you a bit more of an insight uh, into what to look out for. Um, the, the floor is now yours, so we'd really welcome any questions or, or comments that you have just broadly around the subject of mental health or, or in particular or on depression. Assalamu uh, alaikum, um, brothers and uh, Sheikh. Um, I would just like to ask a question, not so much on depression, but more on sort of just general nerves and anxiety. So obviously at the moment I'm in year 12, so you know, A-levels, tough times, and last year, same GCSEs, leading up to uni, this time next year, I'll be going for interviews and uh, finalizing my UCAS application, etc. cetera. Um, and sometimes sort of now, especially I've got my mocks sort of in the next two or three weeks for AS, um, I sometimes feel as if <coughs> revision is kind of taking over my life in a way. I don't really feel like doing the other things that I usually used to do, like play on the PlayStation, whatever, go out with friends, I'm so focused on that. I'm always thinking about that before I go to sleep. When I wake up, I'm thinking about, you know, what if I flop my mocks, my life is going to go upside down. I won't get to this university, this type of employment, whatever. Um, at my age, what do you think is the best way to combat these issues of anxiety and nerves leading up to exams? Like, obviously, the easy way out is to say, you know, sleep more. That's what my mom says. She says, you're not getting enough sleep. Sleep more, you know. Um, and I've also realized that sometimes my appetite is a bit less. Yeah, like um, obviously you mentioned. So what's the best way to counteract these issues? Yeah, um, I think what you described sounds pretty common among students of your age and even older students as well. I'd, I'd probably be more worried if you, if you wasn't uh, a little bit nervous about your exam. So I don't think it's uh, nothing to worry about too much, but there is some practical uh, material out there. Like for example, there is a, uh, one of the things I would suggest is uh, there's sometimes, um, I've used like, so I can basically say for myself, hypnotherapy. I used to suffer with exam nerves awfully, 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 but there's a hypnotherapy, like a self-help CD that you can listen to and it basically um, teaches you certain techniques to actually calm the symptoms of anxiety so that you can basically relax in, diff in specifically difficult situations. So 
that's something that I would I would suggest that's just a practical. But in terms of what you've you've outlined, it, it sounds pretty pretty common. Nothing to stress about the stress if you get what I'm saying. Uh, if if I can uh, add to that, um, certainly feeling uh, nervous is a, a natural thing and actually a good thing um, to a certain extent because it really keeps you on the ball, it keeps you alert, it keeps you energised and motivated. Uh, if you were less and less and much less anxious, then you, you might start falling asleep or you wouldn't be taking it seriously. If it gets to a point where it's, it's starting to affect your concentration, um, there's, I guess, a universal principle uh, around balance. Um, if I give you the example of a mother, um, a mother is really committed to her children. She works tirelessly to make sure that they, their lunches are made, uh, that the um, house is clean, the food is cooked, that the homework is done, um, and she really works herself to the bone. And you know what? One day she falls ill. Now, her thinking and her motivation, her intention is pure. So she keeps working through the sickness, working through the sickness. Do you think she's offering the same quality of care to her children, working, pushing herself that hard through her sickness? Probably not. What she needs to do is get a little bit of balance. She needs to listen to her body, and she needs to take some time to rest so that she can come back and perform at her best. Similarly, as a student, if your guilt is just driving you into doing nothing but study, 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 there is a point at which your mind will be exhausted. It just won't take in anymore. In which case, and parents do, you know, feel free to challenge me on this, play half an hour of PlayStation. Yeah, get, get some rest. Go out for a, a, a jog. Eat sensibly. Get fresh air. Having a balance of activities it isn't just good for the body, but for the mind as well. So um, have, have, a, have a, a, a quick look at your, your day or your week and think, how much balance am I getting in here for, for my mind, my body, and, and my soul? Can anxiety cause depression? And can depression be genetic as well? Um, yeah, it's quite interesting you should, you should mention the anxieties come up because anxiety and depression are often, uh, often linked. Um, when people experience anxiety for a long time, they can become depressed. Or people who are experiencing depression become anxious about the future. So they're, they're, you know, there's definitely a link. Um, and you are more likely, this research suggests that you're more likely to experience depression if people in your family uh, have experienced depression. And I think it's at least one in 10 people within the UK throughout their lifetime will experience depression at some point. And can depression be genetic? Yes. Um, the, the research shows that uh, genetics would account for between one and 3% of uh, why, why you're depressed which says there's 99 or 97% of the reason is nothing to do with your genetics. Uh, one of the problems with over-labeling genetics is that we say, hey, it's in my genes, I can't do anything about it. But the reality is, uh, and this is consistent with the justice of our creator, is that he's given us a choice, he's given us a way out. It's not, there may be a part of it in our genes that's part of our test, but we have other blessings that help, help us to overcome that. And Sheikh, from what you described about depression, there can be a very fine line uh, between what you classed as medical depression and um, what then becomes a sin. Um, this can be a factor in preventing people from getting uh, the, the help they need because of the stigma and feeling that because they're a Muslim they shouldn't feel this way. What are the thoughts and comments of the panel on this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's a really good point. So what we wanted to do was draw the distinction between um, what we might define as uh, define it medically to say that it's not just a downward spiral for a couple of weeks, but we uh, retain these feelings on an ongoing basis. 
that in itself does not necessarily mean that one is depressed by the Islamic term of sin. The line is where someone loses their hope in God and thus the God that they judge is no longer actually the God that he is because they do not believe that he is wise enough to know what is right for them or that he doesn't have the power or is unwilling to help those individuals. So if one gets into that point of depression from the strict Islamic terminology, it would constitute a sin. But that in itself actually proves the need to find help, to be able to go to a person because on your own, you have, been, you have not been able to be able to overcome that feeling of sadness to grief, to depression and wade out of it. So if a person, God forbid, is in that feeling where they have lost hope, it is very important for them to go and find help. As um, Safaraz had mentioned, the tenth question was around if one feels like they want to self-harm, if they want to end their life, if they're thinking about wishing for death. And if a person lasts too long in that state, they will not find a way out and they will only long for the way out, which is through death and through well, self-harm. So, it absolutely suggests that if one person is in that state, they do need to go and find help, which inshallah would put back the hope and the faith in God, at least by talking to someone, going through their own faith-based issues, which may actually be part of the reasoning for their depression in the first place. So, all of it does come together, it conspires together to say that if you are depressed, if you are in that clinical position of depression, then yes, you must go to find someone, and that doesn't mean that uh, one is no longer a Muslim or they have not, you know, they've lost a part of, you know, um, their relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Rather, he himself would want that person to be able to go in and find assistance. Does that answer your question in any way? Does that? I agree, I agree. It can be that, uh, it can be um, a catch-22 situation. The reality is it's not supposed to be. If someone feels like they do not have a way out, that necessitates their going to someone who can assist them. And in fact, that's as good as going and knocking on the door of God, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will tell us to find the means to reach him. So for example, he will say within the Holy Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَابْتَغُوا إِلَيْهِ الْوَسِيلَةِ وَجَاهِدُوا فِي سَبِيلِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ O you who believe, have God consciousness, seek a means of proximity to God, a wasila. Strive hard in that way so that you may become successful. So in this sense, for example, if we have a psychiatrist, we have a clinical, uh, we have a psychotherapist, for example, then these individuals are there as the means to return back towards that proximity with God that a person would previously have had. So all of this actually works hand in hand with each other. If someone is feeling like this, they shouldn't say, well, now I'm feeling depressed. I've lost faith in God. God sends me away from him. There's no chance of it. It actually pushes in the opposite direction to find help because that's exactly what's being demanded of you from the Islamic perspective. Well, um, I think we, we, we uh, still have the, the Messiah um, so, and I can see there's a, a few more questions. Um, unfortunately, in order to make sure we, we respect everyone's time, um, we're going to have to to wrap up here. Um, I, I, if I can just uh, end uh, the session on, on on two notes. Just one to say that if if these are issues that are relevant to our community, please give us feedback so that we can arrange more programs or, or similar programs. If there are other issues, then let us know so we can try and tackle those. Uh, and and the last point. Um, is uh, we uh, are not condemned, according to the justice of our Creator, with any burden more than we can carry. And if maybe some of the emotional difficulty feels like it's more than we can carry, then let us remember that one of the blessings we also have is to reach out, to reach out to our fellow brothers and sisters, to reach out to professionals for some help, uh, uh, and I pray that, inshallah, uh, we can make use of those blessings to help us overcome our trials.
عظم الله جورنا وجوركم بمصابنا أبي عبد الله الحسين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه On the afternoon of the 10th of Muharram Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam exits his tent and before he enters into the battlefield he speaks with his sister Sayyidah Umm Kurthum sallamallahi alayha and their conversation is specifically around the grief that Sayyidah Umm Kurthum alayhi salam is feeling at the impending loss of her brother and so she says to him, have you submitted to death? Is this now the time? My dear brother, how can I go on without you? And you can see the pain that Sayyidah Umm Kulthum salam is feeling. How can I go on without you? To whom do I have after you, Ya Aba Abdullah? To whom can I turn to after you? Imam al Hussein is responding and says, Oh my sister, grieve not. For everything within this world must perish. And everybody in this world must die. And everything must return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this conversation between this brother and sister was there to lift her spirit and to say, that Indeed, this is part and parcel of the system of the creation of God. Everything in this world will perish, no matter what it is. If it's the mountains, if it's the stars, everything must perish. Nothing remains with you. And every human being must go through death. And so do not become overly grieved by what is about to happen to me as I ride out into battle. When Sayyidah Umm Kurthum salam was placed in chains, after the women and children had been placed upon the camels, readied to leave outside and through the plains of Karbala and towards the cities as prisoners, the menfolk came towards Sayyidah Zainab and Umm Kulthum and tried to lift them upon the camels. Sayyidah Zainab turned towards the enemies and said, Do you not know that we are the flowers of Al Muhammad? Who are you to place your hands upon us? We will assist each other to get ourselves upon the tent, upon the camels. Sayyidah Zainab first went and lifted Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, her nephew, upon the camel, because he was physically unable to ascend upon the camels himself. Then there were the two sisters left, and that was Zainab and Umm Kulthum. Both of them said to each other, we will assist you. Let me assist you to rise upon the camels. Zainab turned towards Umm Kulthum and said, no, let me help you upon the camel. Zainab placed her hands and Umm Kulthum rose upon the camels. And then she pulled Zainab up onto the camels and all of these rode out. As the family members were being rode out of Karbala, they were led between the bodies and eventually came to the body of Hussein ibn Ali. If nothing else, surely this was the most difficult of time for these two sisters. They had already seen his head being placed upon the spear in front of them. Why now should they be led between the bodies to arrive at the body of Hussein? As they arrive at the body of Hussein, Umm Kulthum alayhi salam cries out. She turns her face towards Medina and says, Oh grandfather, come from Medina to see your grandson. His head severed from his chest. It is his blood from his neck that gives his body his ghusl. And it is the sands of Karbala that blow upon his body that give him his kafan and cover his body. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-zalameen. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من غلبي ينغلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون ما تم حسين يا حسين